everyone. Hi. <laughs> We're here. Um, uh, Debbie and Don here tonight. We're going to uh, again talk about the the rounds, and uh, we wanted to thank you for joining us tonight and uh, tell you thank you for your patience. Last week we were both not well, and um, so we we uh, we we took took a day off and um, got rid of our our illnesses. We actually had the same thing, although we didn't get it from one another. <laughs> <laughs> She's like a couple thousand miles away. <laughs> that transferred that far, but we, we do thank you for your patience. And we're really, really happy to be with you tonight. So how you been, Dawn? How you doing now? Doing good. Feeling lots better than what I was. <laughs> well, and hallelujah, we have uh we've we've uh we've got through Lent. Yeah. And now we're in the Easter season, the most joyous season of the the liturgical year. Um, got a lot of big feasts coming up. Got a like, big feast coming up, and um, uh, that's very exciting because uh, this octave of Easter is amazing. really sort of uh, you know the I don't want to call it the payoff, <laughs> <laughs> sort of the crescendo of you know, these 40 days of Lent that we've been preparing, we've been, um, you know, we've been um, uh, striving and digging a little deeper for holiness and a little deeper for a connection with God in, in a new and renewed way. And then, you know, we have this great East of, Feast of Easter, which is, you know, the most joyful celebration of the year. Um, some might argue that that would be Christmas, but really Christmas is a, 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 a very holy and important uh, time of year, but this is why Jesus came. This is why Christmas happened in the first place, was for this great feast of Easter. And um, and then, you know, we got the, um, uh, the wonderful feast of divine mercy given to us. So that's what we're looking forward to on Sunday. And um, uh, so this is a very, very special week. And so we're glad that we're really doing the rounds of redemption this week because we started them two weeks ago when we were here last. We started the rounds of redemption and started to talk about them because I think of all things, sometimes the rounds can be the most complex or confusing or intimidating uh, one of the one of the parts of the divine will that people kind of can get a little bit intimidated by or confused by, when really all the rounds are are just prayer prayers of thanks and praise uh, to God for the gifts that He's given us and the gift of creation, um, the gift of of redemption, which Jesus uh, obtained for us on the cross. So it's very uh, appropriate that we're talking about the rounds of redemption this week. And then and then we're gonna talk about uh, the rounds of sanctification because this, this third component of the rounds is uh, why Jesus brought the divine will to Louisa was for our sanctification. This is the process where we can purify ourselves and become completely and totally committed to God and living in his will, which is what he intended for us all along from the time of Adam. This was what he wanted, was for us to live completely in his will. And so as we move through these uh, through these rounds, we're really kind of getting the full picture of the divine will and of um, uh, the coming, living and dying of Christ is, is for our redemption it's, and for our sanctification. So um, uh, I think, you know, continuing on from where we were last time, we did read uh, and talk about how the rounds of creation and the rounds of redemption, uh, how, how they kind of went together. But um, the other, other portion of the rounds of redemption has to do with our Blessed Mother. And it's important for us to remember the very... Um, uh, substantial role that our Blessed Mother plays in the divine will, because number one, she is our example. She is our 
um, she's our fearless leader in that she never once questioned the cost. She gave herself totally to God from her conception. She gave herself totally to God. She lived uh, without original sin. She was, she was um, uh, exempt from original sin. She was saved by Christ from the original sin. She uh, never did anything but the will of God. She is our perfect example of what it means to live in the will of God. So whatever it was that God threw at her, and he threw a lot at her, um, you know, it's like, okay, Mary, um, we know you're only maybe like 15 years old, but hey, guess what? Um, you're going to have a baby and, you know, um, and you're going to have to, you know, uh, people are going to say that, you know, how did that happen? Uh, and so you're going to have to live with that humiliation. You're going to have to live with that um, sort of that cloud hanging over you. And she didn't hesitate. She didn't count the cost. She didn't hesitate. When they had to go to Nazareth, um, you know, Joseph was upset and said, oh, my gosh, you know, this is couldn't happen at a worse time. Uh, my wife's about to have a baby. Um, and, and even back up a little bit, she trusted God that Joseph uh, would come around. And if he didn't, God would take care of it. She never counted the cost. She never counted the cost. She never second guessed God and went moaning and groaning and said, oh my gosh, what have you done to me? How am I going to live? Who's going to take care of me? My father's dead. My mother can't hardly take care of herself. What's going to become of us? Yeah. Well, no, she didn't do that. She trusted God. When, when Joseph, when she's nine months pregnant, now those of you who've had babies, I want you to think about this for a second. She's nine months pregnant. She gets on a donkey. <laughs> she gets on a donkey. And she travels for what, like three days or something? And goes to Nazareth. And Joseph is trying to beg out of it and say, hey, my wife, you know, she's going to have a baby anytime. They're like, too bad. Herod says, you got to go. You got to go. And she said, I'm going with you. And went and had her baby in a stable. On a pile of straw. Never counted the cost. Never questioned, never complained, never moaned and groaned. Just wakes her up in the middle of the night and says, hey, we got to go now. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> Pick up a little extra straw. Let's go, you know. And off they went to Egypt in the middle of the night. Now, that trip to Egypt would have taken several weeks, I believe. It's estimated that it took several, several weeks. Or maybe longer than that. Sleeping in the desert. With wild animals and robbers and... and just perfect trust in her creator. <laughs> perfect trust. Never counted the cost. Her and Joseph both did moan and groan, just did what they were told. Goes to the temple to have Jesus, um, you know, to present Jesus. And so, <laughs> and Simeon says, oh, cute little baby. <laughs> Let me see. Let me see what's going to happen here. <laughs> it's going to be painful, Mary. Painful. Painful. A sword will pierce your own heart. Never counted the cost. So we're going to talk about the Blessed Mother. And what she, her little, her, her little role, her role in the rounds of redemption, her role in the divine will. And so Dawn, um, from volume 17, this is from December the 24th of 1924. So this is on Christmas Eve. This is the message that Louisa got uh, about the Blessed Mother. My daughter, the pains I suffer in this virginal womb of my mother are incalculable to the human mind. But do you know what was the first pain I suffered from the first instant of my conception, which I endured all my life? The pain of death. My divinity descended from heaven, completely happy, insensible to whatever pain or death. When I saw my little humanity subjected to death and suffering of love for the creature, I felt this pain of death so acutely that I would have actually died of pain if my div 
if my divine opnets would not have miraculously sustained me, letting me feel the pain of death while I continuing to live. Thus, for me, there was always death. I felt the death of sin, the death of good in creatures, even their natural death. What harsh agony it was for me all my life. I, who contained life, was the absolute owner of life itself, should subject myself to the pain of death. Do you not see my little humanity immobile and dying in the womb of my mother? Do you not feel yourself how harsh and agonizing it is to feel death and not die? My daughter, it is your living in my will that lets you take part in the continuous death of my humanity. Okay, and this next reading is from Volume 1, Chapter 1. When I was 17, I made a novena in the honor of the holy birth of always my lovable Jesus. I wanted to prepare myself for this celebration with the daily practice of various acts of virtue and mortification for the special purpose of honoring the nine months that Jesus humbled himself to be in the virginal womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So I proposed to do nine meditations each day, always concerning the most holy mystery of the incarnation. Oh, that we could all be as holy as Louisa. <laughs> well, nine meditations each day concerning the whole, most holy mystery of the incarnation. And so these, um, what what we're going to give you a, a little sample of, and once again, we're we're in this book, Faithful and Attentive, uh, which is, I think, uh, just, um, it says, a handbook for living in the divine will, which I think is an absolute um, beautiful little book for understanding, learning and understanding the basics of the divine will in so many different ways. So, so here are some of the meditations, some of the rounds that Louisa did in order to do these rounds of redemption. And um, she wrote them out. And um, uh, as she was, as she was uh, ordered to do, um, Jesus had told her, um, you know, to write these things out. And so uh, that's, that's uh, what I, you know, what she, what she did. Um, so, uh, let's just read, uh, a few of these, Dawn. Um, uh, maybe, maybe start with this one. I saw the three persons of the Holy Trinity. I see the three per, I see the, excuse me. I see the three divine persons of the Holy Trinity in consultation, wanting to redeem the fallen, degraded, and miserable human race to accomplish this. The heavenly father desires to send his only begotten son upon the earth incarnate. The son agrees to this noble idea and the Holy Spirit too gives his full consent, their will being one. I love and thank you, most holy Trinity, for your desire to save us. With great ardor, I take your unfathomable love with which you decreed the incarnation of the salvation of the human race and making it my own, I offer it to you again to you in the name of everyone. With that same ardor, I make my own love, dear Jesus, which caused you when the fullness of time was come to strip yourself of the infinite happiness and glory of the unity of the Holy Trinity and become completely unknown, clothed in microscopic human flesh in the, wound of your, in the womb of your Holy Mother. This love I then offer again to you in the name of everyone that you may receive due love and gratitude from us all. So here, you know, Louise is kind of is meditating. And, and once again, these rounds are really prayers and meditations on um, what the Holy Trinity did for us in the in the rounds of creation. We take a look at all that was created for us, how it was created for us why it was created for us and it was re it was created for our pleasure really it was created for our comfort and it was created to give us a glimpse of god who 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 could do such a thing 
who could accomplish such an act? Where did this come from? And why would he do it? He did it for love of us. He had it all laid out before. You know, he 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 did us last. <laughs> he did us last because he got everything ready. He got everything ready. He got the garden ready. He got the plants ready. He got the ocean ready. He got the weather ready. He got the dry land ready. He got the creatures ready. He got everything ready for us. And then after he had it, everything perfect, he brought us. He brought us into it and put us in this, in, in, in what was the Garden of Eden, was the perfect place, the perfect garden. This is what he had intended for us. This is what he did for us. And so we blew it. Okay. Um, you know, uh, we, we don't know how long Adam and Eve lived in the garden. Uh, they may have lived in the garden a week and they may have lived in the garden for, you know, a thousand years. We don't know. But somewhere along the line, uh, Eve decided that the, the evil one tempted her and she, she bought into it. But God knew in his perfect wisdom, in his great omnipotence, he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knows he knew what was going to happen when he created when he created when he made creation. He knew what was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And he did it anyway. That's how much he loved us. Because he had this, <laughs> I hate to call it a plan B, but <laughs> you know, um, he hate to think of Jesus as plan B, but you know, he knew this, the Trinity, it says they, they agreed. Thank you, most holy Trinity, for your desire to save us. They agreed. They agreed from uh, infinity, from no time. There's no time with God. It just always was. And so this unfathomable love which which you decreed the incarnation for the salvation of the human race and making it my own, I offer it again to you in the name of everyone. So Louisa is saying, I take this love that, that the uh, Holy Trinity had for, for mankind, for us. He had such a great love. He, he, he wanted to have a, he wanted to make a plan B. He wanted to make sure to do whatever he could do uh, to make sure that we had every opportunity to spend eternity with him. He wanted us to give us this, this love. And so with that same ardor, I make my own, your love, dear Jesus, which caused you when the fullness of time was come to strip yourself of the infinite happiness and glory of the unity of the Holy Trinity and become almost completely unknown. So it's like, okay, now's the time. They always knew the time. They knew the exact moment. They knew the exact second. They knew who, what, when, where. When he created Mary, he had Mary in his mind from all time. Forever. There was no there was no time when Mary was not in the mind of God. It kind of puts a new perspective on he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. <laughs> yes. He did know you. He he's known every single soul that was ever created or will be created. He knows that soul and he knows what happens. But he knew that we would need this redemption. He knew that we would need, they knew, I shouldn't say he knew, they knew. This says the most holy trinity had the desire to save us. All three of them. Because there's only one will. There's three persons in the trinity. But there's only one will. That's why we say we live in the divine will. We're not living in Jesus's will or God's will or the Holy Spirit's will. We're living in the divine will because it's important to remember that all three persons of the Trinity have the same will. And he desires, they desire for us to be inside that will. We can be outside of it or we can be inside of it. 
we can, there's no riding the fence. That's why I always say you got to pick a lane. You're in or you're out. And yes, sometimes we do go in and out. God wants us to stay in, but he knows our weakness. He knows our um he knows our he knows how our minds have been infiltrated in, in many ways by the world that we live in. And so we've sort of been indoctrinated and infiltrated into this my own will kind of thinking. Uh, but this is one of the reasons why he gives us these realms and these meditations is to remind us that he's given us all these things. He gave us creation. When you're sitting and doing the rounds of creation and thanking God for the leaves on the trees, um, you know, or the birds that are singing in your backyard or whatever it is in, in creation that you're thanking him for, a lot of times I like to think about God always knew he, he always knew that that bird was going to sing at just this moment when I would be sitting here at just this moment. And that was for me. That was for me. He knew I would enjoy that. He's given us so much. And we, yeah. we, we don't even... Uh, we 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 don't even consider so many times. We just don't even consider that all of these things that God has put into place. Because I would say, you know, God is a God of order, and He is a God of perfect order, perfect order. So there's nothing that happens uh, outside the will of God, either in His ordained will or in His permissive will, as far as something like that's concerned. Of course, it's not God's will that he, you know, people are murdered or, you know, um, babies are aborted or it, this is not God's will. We know that. But God allows it in his permissive will. He doesn't intervene. He lets us live our life. Because if we're not free, our love doesn't mean anything. Our love means nothing. Um, you know, a lot of people want to think that God is like this big... Um, ATM machine, you just go up there and punch in the numbers, and he's supposed to spit out whatever it is that you asked for. Uh, sort of this name it, claim it theology, or, you know, um, no, it doesn't work that way. You reap what you sow. That's what Jesus very plainly told us. You reap what you sow. So he's hoping that we sow the good stuff and not the weeds. The good harvest and not the reeds. Um, can you read Dawn down here continuing to observe you in your holy mother's womb? Continuing to observe you in your holy mother's womb, I see that you are immersed in immeasurable suffering because having conceived all our souls in you, you have also conceived in yourself the pains and the satisfactions that each one of us owe your heavenly father. Yes, your passion is conceived together with you. As tiny as you are, I see your little head pierced with, by the thorns that make you cry bitter and burning tears. These thorns are caused by all the evil thoughts of creatures. To dry your tears and comfort you, I offer you in the name of all, the holy and most pure thoughts of your own immaculate mother. I see that you also suffer being constrained to immobility for lack of space in your mother's womb. This in reality is the crucifixion to satisfy divine justice for the lives lived in search of every unlawful prophet as they took crooked roads and commit every injustice. This crucifixion and crowning is continuous for nine long months because the human race never stops conceiving wicked designs and doing evil actions. Let me share in these pains of yours, my little Jesus, and then with a heart bursting with compassion for having felt a share of your sufferings, I come and embrace you even in the womb and offer you the painful love I feel for you. So um, this, this particular meditation um, is focusing on the fact that Jesus 
um, Jesus's suffering began at his incarnation. When I first um, read that, I was I was just amazed, you know, because like, I don't know, I, I always thought, you know, never realized that it was from his very being of incarnation that um, he suffered so many deaths. Yeah, I think we tend to think of Jesus lived just a normal, regular life in a way until he was 30 years old. And then all of a sudden he decided to break out of his, you know, um, mundane, normal life and <laughs> the Christ and walk around, you know, um, uh, Israel and preached to everyone. And that's when the pain started. No, no, no. The pain started from the time of his incarnation. Because just as we saw uh, when we read in the book of heaven and the hours of the passion, particularly, the, the pain that Jesus suffered and the way that he suffered um, that the suffering of Jesus, as horrific as the physical suffering was, the mental suffering was worse. Yes. The the agonizing, the the um, the anguish that he felt over lost souls, the anguish that he felt over uh, the the ones who had rejected him or would reject him, was really the greatest suffering. The physical suffering, yeah, that lasted for a few hours. But this anguish, this knowledge, because Jesus is God, and so he is he has this knowledge. He knows, he knows what's coming. <laughs> he knows what's gonna happen. He knows um uh you know what he's going to have to go through, and the price will have to be paid not only by himself, but by his mother, by his earthly father, by Saint Joseph by his disciples, um, by everyone who would choose to follow him. And this separation, you know, I always say, um, you know, when, when, when someone is dying and we grieve, we grieve because we're losing that dying person. But the person who's dying is losing everyone. And so imagine how much greater their suffering is. Imagine how much greater your suffering is uh, rather than being the person who's standing around the bed of this person that you love who is dying, you're the person in the bed, and every single person around the bed is the person that you love, and you have to leave. You lose everything. You lose everyone. And so this grief that you feel or can feel when you're dying, I think really has a lot to do with the separation that you know that you're going to experience with the people that you love. That's a great analogy. Yeah, Jesus Jesus knew that he was going to lose all these people. Uh, that he was going to outlive, uh, you know, he was going to, he was, they were going to outlive him. And so this was a grief that he felt from his conception. He knew that his mother was going to be left alone. He knew that his mother, who shared everything with Jesus, every pain, every, everything, everything with Jesus. She was so uh, connected with Jesus that she is the only person that could comparatively um, could have been, be compared to say to have suffered as much as Jesus because she suffered every pain. And even when she was told what she was going to suffer, um, she didn't really completely understand it, but she knew that it was true because she was already suffering. She already had that, um, she understood Jesus's teachings better than anyone. And so she knew that Jesus's kingdom, this kingdom of the Messiah was not going to be what everybody thought it was. Right. It, was not, it was not going to be this, you know, great glorious um, uh, kingdom that, you know, all the Christians were going to be the guys on top and the Romans were going to be out. No, that was not the way it was going to be that this kingdom included suffering, that this kingdom included sacrifice, that this kingdom included uh, rejection and difficulty and a rocky, rocky road. But the payoff, the payoff is way, way worth way more 
than whatever suffering that we could experience. So we need to, you know, the point I think of the rounds of redemption is to look at the cost. What was the cost of redemption for us? What was the cost for Mary? What was the cost for Joseph? What was the cost for, obviously, for Jesus? But that Mary, uh, that Mary shared in the suffering, Mary shared in this redemptive, in the cost of this redemption in a way nobody else did or could. And um, so one of the things, you know, obviously Jesus would like for us to, um, to focus on in these rounds of redemption are these excesses of love. He calls them, you know, excesses of love that uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus experienced. So, um, There is, in the rounds of redemption there, Dawn, uh, can we read the rounds of Christmas? Um, hang on. <laughs> yeah. My daughter, the act of being born was the most solemn act of all creation. Heaven and earth felt themselves prostrate in profound adoration at the sight of my little humanity which kept my divinity as though in prison. So in the act of my birth, there was an act of silence and profound adoration and prayer. My mother prayed and re remained enraptured by the force of the prodigy that came forth from her. St. Joseph adored, the angels adored, all of creation felt the force of love of my creative power renewed in them. Everyone felt honored and received the true honor because one who created them needed them to care for his humanity. The sun felt honored to give its light and heat to its creator, recognizing him who had been who had created it, its true Lord. It made Mary and honored him by giving him its light. The earth felt honored, and when it felt me lying in a manger, it felt touched by my tender hands and feet and joyfully exalted with wondrous signs. All creation and created things saw their true King and Lord in their midst. And feeling honored, each wanted to make its particular contribution. The water wanted to quench my thirst. The birds wanted to sing their trills and warbles to amuse me. Everything wanted their innocent tribute. Only ungrateful man was unmoved, even though he felt in himself something unusual, a joy, a powerful force, even though I called him through my tears and sighs and laments. This was true except for a few shepherds, yet it was for man that I came upon the earth. I think for me, like that one line where, how, you know, only in, ungrateful man was unmoved. You know, when we think about that compared to, you know, creation and and we're his creation, but yet we were unmoved by him. And sometimes we we do kind of reject him, um, you know, whether we do something wrong or we think something that we shouldn't, you know, that's calling out our ungratefulness to him. We don't acknowledge God for who he is. Right. You know, and this is a great pain. I'm, I'm sure that this, um, you know, this is, this is a great, a great pain for God that, you know, the Trinity, the Trinity here, they've poured out everything into us, everything, everything into us. And um, how, how few of us even acknowledge him. How few of us even um, give thought, much less thanks, for what he's given us? Um, you know, um, the other day uh, there was there was a sort of a documentary on Moses. Okay, and the, it was a movie. Um, uh, about Moses, but in interim parts, different scholars would comment on 
uh, what was going on, you know, what uh, kind of maybe what was going on in with the Israelites, what was going on with the um, uh, with the Pharaoh, what was, you know, what what was the political situation and what was going on. And um, everybody moaned and groaned. I think what should have been, I think what they called like a 10 day trip or something like that, you know, should have, should have taken them less than two weeks to get there. It took them 40 years. Right. And think about like they had just witnessed. <laughs> yeah. He's parting. Yeah. Yeah, they walk through armies in the Red Sea. They just yeah. walk through the Red Sea. They saw the plagues. They saw them. You know, they had to they had to put lamb's blood above their doorposts to keep from dying. They had a flame of fire at night to lead them. Can you imagine seeing a pillar of fire twirling around in front of you? And lighting lighting up the whole the sky every night, and a cloud that followed them around, you know, that led them through the desert. A big cloud that kept the the army of the Pharaoh prevented him from coming after them when they hit the sea. That they camped at the edge of the sea because this huge cloud kept the Pharaoh and his army away from them, that they could figure out what to do. Well, let's just camp here. And God, you just keep them up there on that cliff. You just keep them up there on that hill. They can watch us, but they can't come down here. And that's what happened. And then they were like, they said, well, we're going to have to go back. You know, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know, you let us out here to die. God said, no, Moses. Use that stick I gave you, you know. There went there went the waters. And the entire army, including the Pharaoh, died in the water. So they were kind of in the clear. I mean, at that point, they don't have anybody. They had to fight the Amorites, I think it was, or something. You know, they they had these little wars that they had going on, people in the desert that decided they didn't like this huge tribe of people coming through their desert. <laughs> But, you know, they won. They would win. And then they were mad because they didn't have any. They didn't like what they had to eat. So God sent manna. Was that not enough? No. 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 They were never satisfied. They were always grumbling. They always wanted more. They were always just satisfied. Ungrateful always and unhappy. <laughs> ungrateful and unhappy and not giving God the credit that he is his just uh his just acknowledgement for what he had done for them and what he had brought them through because it was their own it was their own selfishness it was their own um you know defying you know living outside of god's will every time we get in a pickle it's because we're outside of god's will and you can yeah. take that one to the bank every time we're in a pickle it's because we've been out living outside the will of god and so, uh, but they didn't look at that. They wouldn't acknowledge that. They didn't, you know, it was Moses's fault. It was God's fault. It was, you know, somebody else's fault. Um, until finally, they, you know, that whole generation, it said that whole generation of people had to pass away. Uh, the, the whole generation of people who had lived in Goshen, the whole generation of people who had lived in save, slavery died before they got to the promised land. Because it kind of makes you wonder. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're mumbling and grumbling the whole way. You say, okay, well, you're never going to see it. You're never going to see it. You're going to mumble and grumble like this if you don't appreciate what God is giving to you. You know, and then poor Moses, he's the only one. He didn't get to go in anyway. He, he didn't get to go into the promised land anyway. Joshua went in. Joshua led the people in. Joshua led the people once they got into the to the promised land because of our ungratefulness, because of our lack of acknowledgement and our mumbling and our, you know, this uh, murmuring 
Do you, you know, God calls it murmuring in the Bible, this murmuring that we do. And I believe that this is one of the great reasons for the rounds is to keep this murmuring at bay because it's when we're not appreciating and not acknowledging the gifts that God has given us and this great, great gift of the divine will that we can actually live in his will, that his holiness acts through us. I mean, think about this. When we offer our acts in the divine will, it is Jesus who is doing those acts. They become holy acts because any act that Jesus did, any act that God does, any act that the Holy Spirit uh, chooses to uh involve himself in, this is a holy act. And so our acts become holy. Now, what more could we, what what more do we want? What do we want? Well, yeah. can, my new, my, can my holy acts get me a new car? This is where, <laughs> this is, this is where our heads are at. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah. This is where our heads are at. Our heads are so attached to this world, to this things to these things. We think that things are, you know, uh, and and this is uh, truly, this is what our world has become. How many things do I have? You know, that those, that old joke of the one who wins with, who, who dies with the most toy wins. No, no. The one with the most toys, who dies with the most toys does not win. No, you can't. Because, yeah. Bring any of that with you. <laughs> There's no U-Haul behind you, that casket. No. There's no U-Haul behind that casket. And so what when we're when Jesus tells us, and he tells us, build your treasures in heaven. This is where your treasure should lie. This is where your heart should be focused. And the rounds, meditating on the rounds, meditating on these gifts from God, whether they're the gifts of creation, the gifts of redemption, or the gifts of sanctification, because only God can sanctify us. We can't sanctify ourselves. One of the things I think you begin to understand, and I don't know, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about this, Tawana, is, is I think one of the things that you can really begin to understand is when Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it, it just, um, it's amazing how like I imagine like a pinprick, right? Of this vast ocean. That's you. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And it, I mean, without him, we can do nothing. We, you know, we just need to be thankful and grateful. Um, and every heartbeat that we have is his way of telling us, I love you. I love you. I think that's just so beautiful. And it's a constant reminder that, you know, he has got you. He loves you. He cares for you. He's not going to let something happen to you. <laughs> no, no. And, you know, a lot of times I think, and I, I know you've heard this many times too, is we hear this, well, what's the difference between doing God's will and and living in the divine will well there's a big difference because even though we're doing god's will we're really doing our own will in compliance with god if that makes sense when we're doing the divine will and jesus is acting through us yes our acts become holy our acts become divine acts when we're doing God's will, there still are our acts with a, you know, stamp of approval by God. But when right. we're living in the divine will, these are divine acts. We're totally giving our will. And I think one of the things that can be so helpful in really understanding to the, the great prayer, great meditation is the surrender novena, the yes. surrender prayer. And uh, if you're new to the divine will, or even if you're not new to the divine will, it doesn't matter. I, I still recommend that novena um, and that prayer, the surrender prayer, because it helps us to understand truly our nothingness. Yes, we can act in our own will. And God has given us that power, if you want to call it that, you know, to act in our own will. But acting in our own will is still in our human will. It still doesn't 
there's still nothing divine about what we do. Uh, we're just human. We're just creatures. We're just, you know, we're just little molds that, you know, God put out and uh, he loves us. We each have a soul. We're each unique in that way, but we're not divine. No, we're not little gods. And I'm not saying that, you know, but but actually living in the divine will makes our acts divine, makes them holy. Jesus does these holy acts through us with our permission with our, our um, a surrendering of our will. And uh, so this is where the rounds come in. And I think that one of the things about the rounds of redemption is it helps us to understand why it's important to surrender our will because we are such, we don't understand. We just don't understand. We don't understand what had happened and what did happen in this gift of redemption. In this gift of of uh, of Jesus taking on humanity and uh, coming here as a man for our salvation, for our um, reconciliation with God, because uh, he was the only one. He was the only one that could do it. He was the only one that could do it. The only it one cost him it. so much. <laughs> it cost him so much cost him so much and it cost his mother so much. Yes. And this is why, you know, we need to honor Mary. We need to recognize Mary. We need to love Mary. We need to go to Mary because Mary, the, the only other person who experienced what Jesus experienced was Mary. And maybe she didn't under, maybe she didn't experience, um, death the way Christ did, but she certainly experienced the pain. She experienced all of the pain. And um, uh, it must have been absolute agony for her to stand at the foot of the cross. Agony, you know, it says in the hours of the passion that when Jesus was carrying his cross and Mary fought her way through the crowd to get to Jesus, the Romans wouldn't let her get to Jesus. She, he, they wouldn't. He, they wouldn't let her talk to Jesus. They wouldn't let her reach out and touch Jesus. They held her back. They got in her way. And um, just as another tor, just another torment, another torment for for Jesus and for his mother. And this is when Veronica. Veronica, sweet Veronica, risked her life, absolutely risked her life to just wipe Jesus's face. Um, if you've ever had a head wound, you know how horribly the blood, how yeah. horribly you bleed from a head wound. And so this blood was completely running in Jesus's eyes. And I, I can't even imagine how much that hurt, how much it's, yeah. it was stinging along with the sweat and, you know, the dirt and the, you know all the all the things, all the things that Jesus probably had a very hard time seeing, um, because his eyes were filled with blood and sweat and tears. And um, and here, sweet Veronica comes up and just wipes his face, just to give him a little bit of relief. And what a gift she received by getting that that veil of Veronica. So. Um, what else, Don? Anything else? Um, it goes on in this part, you know, in this Christmas part also, and just talks about um, the coldness of the stable and, you know, what it was like to have to ha have a baby in a stable um, and take care of a newborn in a stable. Um, and Louise even wrote this in here, and it's in volume two, uh, volume two actually, on August 16th of 1899, Louisa wrote a little song for the baby Jesus. The baby Jesus was very, very, very real um, to Louisa. And sometimes Jesus would come to her as a, as a little child, as a baby. Yeah. And so he was very, very real. Um, 
And so maybe we could just read. Um, there's so much in this. Um, there, there is. I there's mean, so there's, there's an exchange of love for all the acts of Jesus's life, mm -hmm. the life of Jesus. We could end with um, with the Canticle of Love if you want. That would be good. That's a beautiful passage. Um, why don't you read the Canticle of Love? And again, I I um, uh, I encourage you, and um, uh, we can take a look at at um, but somehow posting some of these these. Um, these snippets from the rounds and maybe I can do some mm -hmm. snippets on the rounds so that um, uh, we can read some of these portions that we weren't, uh, we just don't have time to read it all. And, um, uh, but we wanted to give you, of course, we wanted to give you this and an, an enough of, uh, of the rounds about the rounds so that you could begin um, to start experiencing the rounds, praying in the rounds, giving praise and glory to God in the rounds, and understand why this is so important. And a, a great deal of the reason is just so that we can acknowledge and appreciate and thank God for the things that he's done for us through the divine will and the divine trinity. So go ahead, uh, Don, and, and read that if you would. Okay, so from volume 10, February 8th, 1911. Hear me well, my daughter, and understand what I tell you. There is nothing created that does not have life from my heart. All creatures are like so many chords that come out of my heart and have life from me. Of the necessity and natural, naturally, all that they do reverberates in my heart even with their merest movements. Consequently, if they do wrong, if they do not love me, if they continuously troublesome, that chord resounds in my heart with sounds of displeasure, of bitterness of sins. And these form wherein sounds so dismal as to make me feel unhappy on part of the chord of life which comes out of me. On the contrary, if they love me, and try to please me in all things. That chord gives me continuous pleasure and forms within my heart festive and sweet sounds, which harmonize within my own life. And in regard to that chord, I receive so much pleasure, even to the point of feeling happy and enjoying my own paradise just because of them. And then it goes on and um, Louisa says, Oh, my Jesus, you are love. You are all love. And I want to love. I desire love. I desire love. I yearn for love. I beg for love. I beseech of you. Love invites you. Love is my life. Love enraptures my heart, even to the bosom of my Lord. With love, I am inebriated with love and I am delighted. I alone solely and only for you. You alone and only for me. Now that we are alone, shall we speak of love? Oh, let me understand how much love, how much you love me, because only in your heart is love understood. And Jesus says, of love, do you want that I speak to you? Listen to my dearest daughter, to my life of love. If I breathe, I love you. If my heart beats, my palpitations say to you, love, love. I am crazy with love for you. If I move, love, I join to you. With love, I inundate you. With love, I surround you. With love, I caress you. With arrows of love, I shoot you. With the love, I dart. With love, I allure you. With love, I feed you. With love, I send sharp arrows to your heart. And Louisa replies, Enough, O oh Jesus, for now. I feel myself fainting with love. Sustain me in your arms. Enclose me in your heart. And from within your heart, let me too find an outlet for love. Otherwise, I will die of love. With love, I am delirious. With love, I burn. With love, I make merry. With love, I languish. With love, I am consumed. 
Love kills me and then gives me new life and makes me rise more beautiful still. My life slips away and I only feel the life of Jesus, my love. And in Jesus, my love, I feel immersed and I love everyone. He wounds me with love. He makes me sick with love. He adorns me with love and makes me richer yet. More do I not know how to say, oh, love, you alone understand me. You alone comprehend me. My silence tells you still more. In your beautiful heart, more is said, though silence by t- through silence, by talking and by loving, one learns to love. Love, love only do you speak, because being love, you know how to speak love. And Jesus replies, love, do you want me to hear? All creation speaks to you of love. If the stars shine, love they say to you. If the sun comes up, with love it kills you. If it shines forth in all its midday brightness, arrows of love does it send to your heart. If the sun set, it says that Jesus dies for the love of you. If it thunders and lightnings, love I send you, and arrows with kisses I send to your heart. Love runs upon the wings of the wind. If the waters murmur, I extend my hands. If the leaves move, I press you to my heart. With perfume of flowers, I entertain you with love. All of creation, mute in speech, says to your heart, only from you do I want life of love. Love I want, love I desire, love I beg from within your heart. I am only content if you give me love. Louisa says, my good, all my insatiable love, if you want love, give me love. If you want me happy, speak love to me. If you want me to content, give me love. Love invests, love puts me into flight, carries me to the throne of my maker. Love shows me the way to the uncreated wisdom and leads me to eternal love where I make my abode. Life of love, I live in your heart. I love, I will love you for everyone. I will love you for everyone. I will love you in everyone. Jesus, seal me with all the love inside your heart. Empty my veins instead of blood. Let there flow love. Take away my breath and make me breathe air of love. Burn my bones and my flesh and weave me all completely with love. Transform me. Love conform me. Love teach me to suffer. Love crucify me and make me similar to you. And Mother Mary says, my child, try to supply all things with love. You should have at heart one thing alone, love, one thought alone, one life alone, love. If you want content and please Jesus, love him and always give him the opportunity to speak love. This is the only thing that gives him comfort and relieves him, love. Tell him to speak to you of love and he will be very happy. Beautiful. It is beautiful. beautiful. Very beautiful. Because this is really what it's all about is just love. Yeah. All, all, all it is about. Okay. Well, we will be with you again next week, barring a f- flood or fire. Or <laughs> <laughs> Calamity. Um, and, uh, uh, really, you know, reap everything that you can, take everything you can from this Easter season, this octave of Easter, particularly on Sunday, um, uh, our great feast of the divine mercy. Uh, the two greatest feasts of the church, in my opinion, happen, you know. Um, yeah, as I was like meditating, you know, there's so many great things coming up, you know, so we have the first Friday and we have the first Saturday and then we have divine mercy Sunday <laughs> and then we have the annunciation. <laughs> That's like, yes. <laughs> and my birthday is um, yes. <laughs> divine mercy Sunday. And I just, I just add that, not that, you know, I'm really wanting to advertise my birthday. So I'm getting so old, but um, here's the thing. What what a blessing. Do you know how many, you know, uh, this is my 70th birthday. And so I've had a lot of birthdays. And some of those birthdays have fallen on Easter. And some of those birthdays have got, fallen on Good Friday. And some of those er, uh, 
birthdays have fallen on Easter Monday. But it's, my birthday has never fallen on Divine Mercy Sunday. And um, oh, yeah. no, it's never, it's never been on my, uh, I have a sister-in-law whose mother was born on Easter and never had a birthday on Easter again. Oh, she was, she was born on Easter, never celebrated a birthday on Easter again. I said, no, that was, uh, those were all my birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's Easter. Oh yeah. It's Debbie's birthday too. Yeah. Whatever. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the chocolate? Where's the chocolate? Um, but yeah, this is a very, very, very special time and a very special, we have so much to be thankful for and so many blessings, so many graces that are available for God. I, I just want to remind you because Jesus and his mother talks to us all the time about the wasted graces and we don't want to waste them. We, they're, they're, given, they're given to us, they're pouring them out, they're, they're pouring them over us. And we're just like batting them away. Uh, and this this hurts them. You know, they want us to have these graces. So take all the graces you can get this week. Um, certainly go to First Friday, go to First Saturday, go to Divine Mercy Sunday. Um, go to uh, confession. Go to confession. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and you can go to confession. You can go to confession tomorrow. You can go to confession mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to go to confession on Divine Mercy Sunday, although right. any place you go for Divine Mercy Sunday, or if you go to a celebration of Divine Mercy in the afternoon, which usually happens in the afternoon in most parishes for the three o'clock hour, there's usually priests there to hear your confession. And of course, it's wonderful to do that. But what's required is that you, uh, you um, go to confession eight days before within an eight day period of, uh, we're, again, we're, we're kind of looking at that octave of Easter within an eight day period of that, um, of that feast. Um, but, you know, but also to say the rosary, to meditate on the rosary um, and uh, to say the chaplet are, are uh, really the elements of receiving this extraordinary indulgence, extraordinary indulgence. Yes. Because this indulgence, if you don't realize that this is this indulgence is as good as being baptized. Um, it uh, remits all of your sins. It it wipes away and it's temporal punishments. It's too, temporal right? punishment. It's a get out of purgatory free card for <laughs> that afternoon anyway. Um, <laughs> until you have have time to get home and mess up, but. <laughs> No, but you know, it's it's a, a great, great gift that God has given us to show us the immensity of his mercy. Uh, and if you read the read the diary, read the beautiful, beautiful diary. If you have a diary, I would strongly urge you, if you don't regularly read it, certainly pick it up and read it this week, just as a reminder of what a great feast this is and, and the sacrifices that were made for us to have this feast. Uh, because it didn't really come easily. It, uh, it, you know, had to push through a lot of barriers. So with that said, Dawn, um, what else? I'm doing all the talking here. Pretty much it in a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell. But a big move. So we will see you next week. And we will be talking about uh, the rounds of sanctification. And uh, once again, we're just we're just you know trying to give you a flavor of what these rounds are, and how you can go deeper into them with some uh, understanding of why these particular rounds and what they do for us. And uh, you know, this journey into the divine will is really an extraordinary journey, and there's so much to be gleaned from living in the divine will. And the rounds are one of those wonderful gifts of the divine will. And it's one that's often kind of overlooked or misunderstood or, you know, we can kind of take it or leave it, but no, Jesus tells us these rounds are very, very important. So um, Don, if you could, would you lead us in a prayer and then we'll be saying good night. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Trinity, we thank you for this opportunity that you have given us to um, hear your word and be in your will 
and we ask for the knowledge, understanding to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So we will see you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, MCAT. Thank you for your, your comments. You know, we didn't get a lot of comments tonight. And we love to see your comments. We love to see that you're here. Yeah. And uh, one of these nights, we are going to do just a QA. Um, we're just gonna we're just gonna take questions and we're gonna try to answer questions. Um, uh, because we know that a lot of you are new or a lot of you haven't been in the divine world for a long time. And we all have questions. I have questions, everybody has Me questions. too. <laughs> No, we all have questions and maybe some of our own questions we can we can research and, and have answered um, so that we can have our own questions answered. But um, this this is how we learn and this is how we grow. And this is this is why we're doing this is because we all need to continually learn and grow in the divine will. So until next time. Uh, fiat. Fiat. Thank you, Don. <laughs>